The year is 1942, and the great French liner Normandie has sailed into New York Harbor. The United States has been in the Second World War for just 60 days. With every ship now needed for the war effort, the blue ribboned winner is being fitted out as a troop ship. Suddenly, the alarm is sounded. Fire. An explosion has burst the ship, and flames are spreading rapidly. Within hours, the Normandie is ablaze. Within a day, the pride of the French passenger fleet is a wrecked hulk. The chiefs of naval intelligence are worried. It must have been sabotaged by Nazi fifth colonists. How can they stop the same thing happening again and again? They ask the official harbor authorities, who confess that the waterfront is really controlled by quite another organization, the Mafia. Nothing can happen in the docks without their agreement. Swallowing their pride, naval intelligence officers first approach Joe Sox Lanza, notorious Tsar of the Fulton fish market. But he admits that he has no power over the docks. They are controlled by Charles Lucky Luciano from a prison cell. Luciano, capo di tutti capi, boss of all the bosses, had been put away by crusading district attorney Thomas E. Dewey for 30 to 50 years. The charges, extortion and running prostitution. So an extraordinary conference was held in Sing Sing prison a few weeks later. Meeting the naval authorities and Dewey's men, the Luciano, and racketeers Frank Costello and Maya Lansky. The Navy asks, would Luciano ensure that there is no more sabotage in New York Harbor? At first, he seems reluctant. Then he offers a deal, his freedom in return for a guarantee of protection. After consultation, the Navy and Dewey agree, but Charlie Lucky could not be set free until after the war. As the Allies fought towards victory, there was no more sabotage in the docks. In 1943, Luciano put the authorities further in his debt by contacting the Mafia in his home turf of Sicily before the Allied landings and asking them to help the invading Americans. That left only one unsolved mystery. Who started the Normandy fire? Years later, Luciano claimed that it had been set up on his instructions. The whole sabotage scare had been a scam to get himself out of jail. The fact that he was holding up his adopted country in time of war wouldn't have bothered Luciano. There has never been a more ruthless or murderous criminal, or a cleverer and wilier one. Born Salvatore Lucania, he came in 1906 at the age of eight as part of the great tide of Italian immigrants to the Lower East Side's Little Italy. Often arrested as a child for stealing, he spent four months locked in a truant school. Regularly beaten by his father, he left home and slept where he could. At the age of 18, he was sent to the notoriously harsh Hampton Farms Penitentiary for a year for peddling narcotics. His reward for keeping silent when arrested was to be made a full member of the Five Points Gang, alongside the infamous Al Capone, Frankie Yale, and Johnny Torrio. He spent his spare time at the racetracks and gambling, when he gained the nickname Lucky. As the Italian and Jewish gangs fought for territory on the Lower East Side between 1915 and 1920, he committed more than 20 murders, often with an ice pick or baseball bat. In 1919, he was officially sworn into the Mafia, at that time more of a secret society than the ruthless business it was to become. Then he started his own gang, specializing in protecting the brothels of New York from being smashed up by the members of the gang. Gradually, Charlie Lucky took over the brothels himself until he controlled over 5,000 women. This was the era of prohibition when bootlegging and speakeasies flourished. Luciano was prominent in both, acting as liaison between the Italian and Jewish bootleggers. He was also active in drug smuggling. His empire became the target for other gangsters' ambitions. 
1929, he was kidnapped by Legs Diamonds Gang. Four men beat him while their car cruised slowly through the streets. He was dumped with blood pouring through his expensive suit and with deep cuts in his cheeks and throat. Somehow he survived to tell the cops, I don't know where, what, nothing. I'm pals with everybody. By 1930, he was skimming an estimated $800,000 a year for himself. He had a permanent suite at the Barbizon Plaza Hotel under the name of Charles Lane. And when the Waldorf Astoria was built, he moved to an even more lavish suite there, using the name Charles Ross. It was around this time that he had his great idea, which was to transform crime in the US, to create a national crime syndicate to share out the spoils and eliminate gang warfare. At first, he had to take part in the bitterest fighting New York had ever seen. The Castellamarese War of 1930-31, between the Sicilian Salvatore Maranzano and Joe the Boss Masseria. Frustrated by what he perceived as a sterile, wasteful battle, Luciano decided to eliminate both leaders. On April 15, 1931, he invited Masseria to lunch at the Villa Tamaro restaurant in Coney Island. They discussed how to kill members of Maranzano's gang. While Charlie Lucky happened to be in the washroom, a black limousine drew up outside. Four of Lucky's gang, Albert Anastasia, Vito Genovese, Joe Adonis and Bugsy Siegel burst into the restaurant and shot Masseria to death. Luciano pretended to Maranzano that he had killed on his behalf. In gratitude, the Sicilian named him as head of one of five families he was dividing New York into. But within a few months, he was planning to eliminate several of his nominees. He hired a non-Italian, Vincent Mad Dog Cole, to kill Luciano. But Charlie Lucky got to him first. His killers caught Maranzano at his office by Grand Central Station. They shot him four times stabbed him six, and then slit his throat to make sure. Now Luciano could start to put his vision into operation, and he divided up the rackets on the model of respectable corporations. He gave Louis Lepke the garment industry and the unions. Frank Costello was made overlord of gambling. Dutch Schultz got the liquor concession. Maya Lansky was the banker, laundering their vast incomes. Albert Anastasia ran the docks and Murder Incorporated, the heavy mob that killed when it was told to. And Luciano himself held on to prostitution and drugs and took the chair at company meetings. Luciano was greatly helped by the widespread corruption in public life in New York. Tammany Hall, the Democratic Club, was in mafia pay. As was Mayor Jimmy Walker, a former writer of popular songs. Walker, in turn, relied on police chief Grover Warren. If it weren't for the fact that you are at the head of the police department in this city, my confidence in you is no greater than that of every citizen of this community. And I'm confident whether I were present or absent, it wouldn't make any difference because you are the sole head of the police department in this city. You who have rid risen from the ranks of patrolmen. But what he failed to mention was that Warren took bribes from Frank Costello. By 1933, there was massive public discontent in the city. A hard-fought election campaign brought in Fiorella LaGuardia on an anti-mob ticket. Fiorello H. LaGuardia, do solemnly swear that you will support the Constitution of the United States, the Constitution of the State of New York, and that you will faithfully discharge the duties of the office of mayor of the city of New York according to the best of your ability. I do. Now we have a mayor in New York City. I have just assumed the office of mayor of the city of New York. His determination was soon evident with the confiscation and smashing of gaming machines. There was also a drive to seize illicit arms and dump them in New York Harbor.
LaGuardia also went after the mob directly by appointing Thomas Dewey as special prosecutor. The real problem is to remove the influence of the racketeer from politics. Local authorities in New York and in almost every great city in the country hold office by grace of politicians who are in partnership with criminals. Dewey made Dutch Schultz his first target, bringing him to trial in Albany for income tax evasion on his bootlegging profits. Against all the evidence, the jury, which was both cowed and bribed by the mob, found Dutch not guilty. Incensed, Dewey announced that he was going to get the Dutchman for murder. Schultz came to a meeting of the syndicate with a plan to strike first and kill Dewey. But Luciano vetoed this, and Schultz stormed out, vowing to do the job with or without permission. Now challenged from within, as well as by the DA's men, the crime syndicate decided to kill Schultz. The job was given to Luciano's bodyguard, Charlie the Bug Workman, and on the evening of October 23, 1935, Schultz and three of his henchmen were shot to death in the Palace Chop House at Newark, New Jersey. Perhaps unaware of how narrowly he had escaped death, Dewey turned his attention to Luciano, now unrivaled as the big boss. With a string of racehorses and an income of more than a million dollars a year, Luciano now behaved more like a businessman than a hood. Living in luxury at the Waldorf Astoria, he only left Suite 39C to make untapped phone calls and accompany his regular mistress, the entertainer Gay Oliver, to mix with New York's fashionable set. As Dewey's men closed in, he prudently moved his headquarters to another state, Arkansas. Meanwhile, back in New York, Dewey was getting embittered employees to talk. Having paid Luciano a large proportion of their income for years, veteran prostitutes began to testify against him, providing enough evidence for a grand jury to indict him on 90 counts of running a vice business. Thomas E. Dewey's office. Mr. Dewey, just a moment, please. battle to extradite him from Arkansas. But at last, in May 1936, Charles Lucania, as he was called on the charge sheet, found himself in a New York courthouse. Caught out in lies about the rackets and trapped by testimony obtained by often dubious means, he faced a hostile Judge McCook He was sent down for a minimum of 30 years, the heaviest jail sentence ever given for vice. Examined on arrival in prison, he was found to have syphilis and be a drug addict. For a while, it looked as if crime would cease to pay after all. With Luciano away, Dewey went after Vito Genovese who was attempting to move into his place. The heat proved too much, and Vito fled to Italy. Dewey's hunt continued, and he reinforced his determination to protect informers. 
mob can't touch him and they won't touch him. Have you made that clear to him? I had. All right. Rabinowitz was the same way, but now that the case is over, he knows that we protect our witnesses completely. Every witness the people have had has, test has been protected 100%, and they always will be. Now, have you made that clear to Pasquale? I certainly have. He also relied on public appeals. During the past two years, five former members of this gang have been shot. And now, a respectable citizen has been killed by bullets apparently intended for another Lepke associate. Lepke must be found dead or alive. Then the racket busters found a canary who was willing to sing. The testimony of Abe, Kid Twist Relis, was to solve 49 gangland hits. Among the people he sent to the electric chair was Louis Lepke Buchhalter. Relis was hidden at Coney Island's Half Moon Hotel, but even Dewey could not save him from the mob's vengeance. Supposedly guarded by six cops, his body was found six stories below his room. How he got there remained a mystery for 10 years. Then Luciano revealed that he and Frank Costello, seen here testifying at the Key Fowler hearings in 1951, where the power of the mob first became apparent to the American public, had paid $50,000 to bribe the guards to hit him with a billy club and then throw him out of the window. Among those on the take for this gangland execution, William O'Dwyer, then Brooklyn's district attorney, who later became a notoriously corrupt mayor of New York. We're talking about the death of Abe Relis. Mr. Balls had one theory, you have another, I have another, and somebody else has another. Now the complete investigation is going to be made. I'm prepared to talk about the facts in the case. You're prepared, to, and you are talking about some dream that you have in your mind, Senator. I some have no innuendo. dream, no, no dream at all. Well, Mr. A little child could understand this, and I say again, you said that no statute of limitations runs against a murder case. Yes. That's the law. But I said, and I asked your assent to it as a man, but a disappearance of witnesses by death or otherwise is just as effective in nullifying as a statute of limitations, isn't it? If what you're saying is that if you don't have witnesses, you can't prosecute or I get say, a conviction, you you're right. You can't put words in my mouth. The English language is plain. The sentence is fair. I ask you a question, yes or no? I will agree that right. uh, if Thank there are no much. witnesses, you can't prosecute. All the time he was in jail, Charlie Lucky had kept control of the National Crime Syndicate. And even now, after 1946, when he became the most notorious of many undesirable aliens deported to Italy, he still got his share of the proceeds. Banned from America, he slipped back across the Atlantic to Cuba in 1946. Maya Lansky was running the gambling casinos on a deal with the dictator, Batista. At a conference, Luciano beat off a challenge to his leadership from Vito Genovese, who had returned to the United States. During this conference, the decision was made to kill Luciano's lifelong friend, Bugsy Siegel. Bugsy had been transforming Las Vegas into America's gambling capital with the help of the mob's money. But he was slow paying off the $5 million that the syndicate had invested, and Lucky demanded a quicker payment. Bugsy retorted that he would pay when he was damned good and ready. A few months later, he met the fate of all who crossed the syndicate, shot through the window of his girlfriend, Virginia Hill's house. She was also at the Kefauver hearings to be questioned about her role as money carrier between Luciano and other Mafia associates. Did you ever get any money from uh, Costello? No. And uh, did you ever uh, get any money from Maya Lansky? I never got money from any of those fellas. None of those none fellas. None of those fellas. None of, the, none none of, of these that I've been reading about or none that I knew, they never gave me anything.
When the FBI heard that Luciano was once again in the Western Hemisphere, it pressured Batista to deport him. Luciano vainly attempted to enter Brazil and Venezuela before accepting his fate and returning to Italy. Now he turned his attention to setting up a new drug smuggling network that was to stretch from the Middle East through Italy to the United States. Upset at his illegal trip and worried about a crime syndicate he was setting up in Rome, the Italian government barred him from the capital. He was forced to live in Naples. Despite the efforts of the Italian police, Luciano successfully used his links throughout Italy to establish a trade which flourishes to this day. Luciano continued to dream of being able to return to the United States, but there was little chance. Italian and American police knew that he was one of the major figures behind the growing narcotics trade, but they could do little to nail him. Restrictions were often placed on Luciano's ability to travel. In 1949, he was briefly arrested and jailed for drug running, but there was not enough hard evidence to convict him. In 1955, he was put under curfew and banned from leaving his house between dusk and dawn or traveling more than 16 miles from Naples. Luciano's life in Italy in the 1950s was not unpleasant. He opened two legitimate businesses. His friends kept him well supplied with money. During the 1950s, he was closely involved with the beautiful Igea Lissoni until she died in 1958. In Naples, despite restrictions, Luciano could mix freely with reporters and visitors. And as this film shows, he became quite a tourist attraction. Towards the end of his life, he dreamed of an epic film glorifying his career. But for once, he lost out when the rulers of the syndicate sent word that they considered such a movie to be dangerous to their positions. On the 26th of January, 1962, Luciano went to Naples airport to meet the producer of the projected film. As he reached his car, his features contorted with a heart attack that killed him within minutes. In death, he was granted the wish that had eluded him for the last 16 years of his life. After a requiem mass in Naples, he was allowed back into the United States to be buried in the family vault he had purchased in Queens, New York City.